This meeting is being recorded. <laughs> hey, everybody. I'm here. We're on Women of the Stars with the First Lady Erica, and we have Terry Smith from the Smith and Bailey team. Um, Mr. Smooth over here in the corner. <laughs> Jonathan. Hello, hello. My That's going to be the new inside joke. Inside joke. <laughs> Mr. Smooth. And our guest of honor, Mrs. Heidi Pop. Howdy. Howdy. Hello. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited to be here with you and your beautiful, glowing, shining face today. <laughs> Thank you, Ring Light. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. I love chatting with you, ladies. I just feel like we should have some baked goods in front of us right now. Like, let's just have some cake. <laughs> <laughs> And we, yeah, for the for the PTA. For the PTA. So well, you got some new things going on, and I'd like to hear more about them. You got you relaunched and your new show. What's it called? Well, it's still a funny little thing. Yes. I I'm just saying now a high vibe human experience hangout because I absolutely adore everybody's journeys yep i know i know right it's a little too much <laughs> Triple H. I was, you got like a wrestler name with heidi, <laughs> with heidi. <laughs> with heidi. <laughs> yes but i i kind of branched it in series i'm doing this whole thing with the homeschool moms and that's been a really fun journey because it's such a broad it seems like it's a tiny avenue but it's a very broad subject and the way to go about homeschooling um, is done so many different ways. So we're sharing our journeys with that. Then I have this little series, Kids Health, with my buddy Lawrence, um, who I've known forever. And his clients are kids and families. And he just gets to the root of things. And um, it's just a really fun ongoing. Every two weeks, we're, we have our fifth episode this weekend. And then the other series, there's kind of three of them. The other is the High Vibe Hangout. And I'm just having conversations, living the authentic high vibe life, like those walking the walk and talking the talk and sharing their human experience. And that's been really fun. <laughs> it's just, it's been fun. I'm showing a lot of SoCal way showers, those that are here in LA flipping it light, um, just friends with healing modalities, friends who just exude light and just sharing their experiences. So I just love to talk. So I just revamp things and just keep talking. <laughs> But the kid thing and the mom thing, yeah, that's that's a mission. That's it. Being human one on one. That's what we're doing. Just just yeah. wanting to be a better human. Yeah. I, I like that. So was this um how did you even start? Because you're really from a hospitality background. And I mean hospitality, not hotels and restaurants, but but um hospitality management with uh in the movie business which is funny. I went to school for film and digital media. And so I totally get the crafts lady is actually the most important lady there is, you know, you don't want to piss her off. She's not going to bring you your gluten-free snacks. If you don't, if you fuck with her, it's over. So how, how did you get into that hospitality and then come to this? I know that's, it is kind of a fun gritty. And yeah, but craft service is like the mom on set. So I loved it. I doted on everybody. But I started in front of the camera and I started when I was young. I started in Chicago. It was like 13, 14 when I started getting headshots and, you know, had agents putting me out there for a lot of industrials, a lot of print work. And I was taking courses at the Piven School in North Shore, Chicago, which is like the Cusacks and Piven started this school. And then I went into DePaul University for the school of acting to really get into the craft. However, it was a lot of theater, which I obsessed with, but I was already booking. And they're like, you gotta cut your age in. It's a conservatory. You you have to just be all in with the craft. And I, I admired it, but I was already taking work. And I also was busy at school. I danced for the DePaul Blue Demons. I was like, I was very busy with organization. So it was hard for me to just focus on the school of acting. So I wound up going into the school of education and, you know, my folks were like, just get a degree and stop me. You got this opportunity. And um, so I started getting my credentials to be a teacher 
but at the same time going on auditions and, you know, getting booking work. And um, I was started at the 13, 14, you know, I started extra work when movies would come to town. So I was really fascinated with the going ons on set, how crew operated, everybody. I mean, everybody had a part to play, a bunch of carnies on set. I mean, there's like, um, have, have, have I met Carl Burnett? I haven't met her, but I want to. You can't read the questions, how it goes along. Okay. See, I broke the fourth wall. I'll, I'll let you finish your story. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, cut to, let's see. I was balancing the, the act, or acting with school. I wound up being a floater at a private school in Chicago. And they loved the audition part of it all. They're like, you can go do that. And so I had these two worlds going. And then I got engaged. I was kind of going down this road of now, you know, am I going to give my energy and effort into this business? Because it is 24 seven. You're always, you know, soliciting or doing your headshots and taking courses and doing a lot of investment in it. And I was kind of giving a choice. And I basically uh, through the guidance of my folks, too, it's like it's OK to say no. And when I weighed everything out, I didn't want to get married. I was like, I'm going the wrong way. So I gave him the ring back and the blizzard of 99 in Chicago came. And so I was walking to work in the blizzard going, what am I doing? And by November 2000, I was driving out to L.A. with two of my film buddies. I was doing independent films in Chicago, too. Two of our my film buddies and I, we rented a place in Encino and we started doing that hustle. I never waited tables. I always got work within the industry. So like my very first job um, this is before smartphones, by the way. I had a, the Thomas Guide map on my lap and a little CB radio, and I was delivering for the breakdown services, which is like the casting calls. So I'm going to like William Morris mailroom and the agents' mailrooms and hustling. And at, at all, every stoplight, I'd look through the box and be like, ooh, who are they submitting? And I put my own picture in it, <laughs> and I put my pager number, and my pager had my my guy friend announced, welcome to Sunshine Agency. You know, we we <laughs> they were basically it was a kind of a facade. But I started reading for soap operas and stuff in that way. And um, um, then it just kind of started working at Sunset Gower Studios. I started hustling that lot. I became like executive assistant and a receptionist. I just started meeting people. And then um, and then my agent team, Reality TV, came out. And I was like, I'm an actor. Like, I'm not going to do reality TV. People are like, oh, you should be a host. Like, my Ooh. agent team, my management were like, oh, do some hosting. And I'm like, um, I, I'm going to be opposite Joaquin Phoenix in Academy Award. We move. No, I can't host. I'm an actor, you know. So then I got old and I was young 30s. And I started, it was really hard to book work. I was working actor for a while, but it was hard to, like, land the stuff. And I was a dime a dozen. There was a lot of mid-America brunette, light eyes kind of gal. And so when that stalled, I got this opportunity. This um, friend of mine did craft service for high-end jobs. And she said, I had a really lull where I'm like, I need some income here. And she goes, shadow me on set. You might like this. And I shadowed her. And I'm like, this is a dream job. I got snacks. And I get to take the leftovers, so I'll never go hungry again. I get to dote on everybody I've ever wanted to work with, and it'll kill the time. And I'll meet people. So if you ever wanted to be on set again, you know, or be in front of the camera again. And anyway, it was about, um, yeah, it was about 35, 36 where I transferred over. I, I started going out for her for craft service. And then within a year, I had my own kit, my own referrals. And then it was 15 years of referrals on set I just I just merged all my loves basically and um, I, I should preface though when I first moved here and I was doing the courier stuff I was also getting my certification to be a substitute teacher because I had all those credentials so I'm like well I can always teach and then but there was no um, freelance opportunity you had to commit if you were going into the classroom that day you couldn't leave and my pager was blowing up so I couldn't do that <laughs> so um, I would teach kids on camera acting. I would nanny. I would um, shuttle kids to their auditions or set or anything with kids and set. And so I was making a living here and there. It was a great freelance lifestyle. 
And then when craft service came, you know, I worked part time, but made a full time salary. You know, the union kicked in and insurance and and again, free groceries. That was I missed that the most. And I think that was all of it. <laughs> was that a good rant? <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny because I was going to ask you, did you meet Carol Burnett? And then you you made the reference. I'll never go hungry again. <laughs> like going with the wind. She says, this God is my witness, you know. So I thought that was funny. Um, <laughs> I worked on her stages. Yeah, I worked on all, the, all, all the stages. Yeah, you can see her little there's plaques. Like, I Love Lucy was shot here. Carol Bonnet show was shot here. A lot of the, the, the old school stuff are honored um, within the stage halls and stuff. So it's fun. Wow. So I heard that she really has a beef when it comes to untrained actors. Oh, and I'm not and octars because she's trained. You know, a lot of people, if you don't go to like the uh, the actual schools, and I believe mm -hmm. one of them would be Juilliard, right? Like, but then That's there's a big one. Like, the new New York schools. My friend, she went to the Alvin Ailey School of Dance, and I noticed even with modeling, like there was a Millie Lewis Academy where I was. That that people who just end up in the business versus people who were you know, paying the cost to be the boss, they, there's a, a rift between the two, right? There, there has been, I did learn even from an early age, just being an extra and watching. It was just, if you're in, com if you're comfortable in front of the camera, anyone could do it. That's the thing. If you can have, you can have the best script in the world and the best director in the world, but if you are not the character or, you know, it's like, eh, they're okay. So it doesn't even take training i always thought i mean i was i once i went into the improv world i thought i thought it was gonna be drama with joaquin phoenix that was my goal but then i found the improv scene and you know the improv olympic and second city and i went out for mad tv i had two callbacks for that what? and I, I was really into character work and the physical comedy carol burnett stuff like i was I'm like, I'm, I would see myself, I'm like, I'm very animated. You know, that's hard to be in a dramatic love scene with Joaquin Phoenix, <laughs> but I can be in a physical comedy with him. Um, so there's, I just noticed if you're either uncomfortable, uncomfortable or comfortable in front of the camera, that kind of made or break you. And that made or break the set. When the most, one of the most uncomfortable person I've ever worked with is Britney Spears. And she was just gone and it was her stand-in that did most of the work. Like they just cut, edited it out. It was like the body double stand-in that was animated and comfortable and doing the shots and the crews thanking her because we could get through the day. It's the uncomfortable ones that you had to keep stopping. You know, there's a lot of people riding on that one person to get it right. So they assume, you know, training is great, but if you just pay attention, and you know get that take that they want so they can move on with the next set then you're working again because they're like oh we can work with that they're efficient <laughs> that was really it. like one, one word you taught me the micro economy if people can understand what that means yeah yeah that's like um the super duper a-listers or even those new on the scene that just become a wildfire internationally like people just love them they become this micro economy, this business, because you begin to employ thousands of people. You become a product. And some of those then sign in, like Jim Carrey, High Priest of the Luma Donkeys, or some, you know, <laughs> just manage their business and they stay clean and healthy and, and don't go to the parties and they become an amazing business person. Others just, you know, go for the ride. <laughs> and then get everything they think they dream of. That they think they dream of. Yeah, yeah. reminds me of the wish master. <laughs> make the wrong wish and it all turns into crap. So <laughs> not what it, uh, I, show, I showed Terry a video the other day, a girl, um, gosh, I can't remember her name. Sukiyama, Sukiyama, and she was just bragging about, I gotta get out here and make this money. And then she she had one video where she was just bawling in tears saying, I signed a contract, I sold my soul. And she was just telling people like, hey, this isn't what you think it is. Don't do this, you know? And uh, we're not gonna get into that, but I mean, you just wonder exactly what it is, because you've heard the stories of what that is, but uh, 
But then who, what, what makes you decide that this money or this fame is more important than your life? Yeah. And like you say, becoming a product. I remember I had seen something one time where they said that Lady Gaga, um, her assistant had to sleep with her at night because she was always having all these dreams and anxiety and nightmares. And mm -hmm. Remember, I was telling you ladies too, one of my, my dearest pals, she works with energy and acupuncture is here. And one of her clients worked for Gaga and she kept having this recurring cancer takeover. And it was only when she wasn't on tour with Gaga that she would start healing. And then she, she ultimately, she transitioned, she died. And the, my friend, the practitioner, you know, they became close and she's like, do you need to work for this woman? Like, I, I'm sensing that this is getting you sick. It's toxic. And then you just hear from these people are subs that, you know, sell their soul and they can suck the life out of anybody and get the life force they need from anybody around them. So they usually have dark ones as well around them. A lot of those that are of light can't sustain working with them. Um, but, but these people such as that, they, there's teams, it's not just them, they're, they're the product. So there's other people. Yeah, you can't wear the clothes you want, you can't eat the food you want, you can't say what you want. You, you can't say what you want because you have to be, I wonder if people really understand that. You got to even marry whoever they tell you to marry. Like this is serious because your life is really planned out. It's planned uh -oh. out. And, and, and then welcome cloning tech. You know, they could also take you out. But if you're a very successful business, they will keep you in play. You know, that's that's goes into all, you know, that other stuff. But yeah. that's that's there, too. And it's not just the satanic -y stuff. Like, um, I know I don't want to get too dark, but Gay Mafia really controls a lot of Hollywood. They're really big puppet masters and they are. You, you don't hear a lot about oh, them. No. They joke about them on Arrested Development. I don't think people realize like how many television shows you watch and they make these little jokes and you're like, ha ha. It's like, uh, uh take that little thing that was said right in front of you. Cause they joked about that gay mafia on Arrested Development. And- <laughs> Did they go cancel after the that? Mindy, <laughs> I was watching the Mindy show and they made a joke about, um, John Legend's wife, that model, whatever her name is, she's so, oh, yeah. it's so hard yeah. to believe that that woman is a model because I've seen her toes and it's just so gross. I, I think we could have did that too. We could have pulled out all those celebrity feet. In oh, my God. <laughs> I have a good yeah. one for that though. Charlize oh, Theron, yeah. they're boats. Yeah, they're boats <laughs> and their toes are twisted to the sides and all kinds of stuff. And um. And she, they said that she had won the celebrity, no, the billionaire Hunger Games. That's when he made a, a reference to that in the Mindy show. And I was like, what? Let's see what is it, Hunger Games? <laughs> they, they put it in there. They put it in there smooth, too. Yeah. Because I had to watch that like three or four, five times to like, Okay, what's the point? Oh, oh, there it is. Celebrity, then, the billionaire Hunger Games. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's some there's some new reality show called Traders out right now, and it has leftover reality stars in it. Yeah. But it's at a Scottish castle, and it's very um, you know, they they even dr start driving these cars like Handmaid's Tale through the woods, and it it reminds me of um, what's the island with that where they hunt the kids? Well, they hunt the kids everywhere, but oh, I'm getting dark now, but oh, you know, yeah. it's the truth and truth and plain sight. They're just playing. They're they're using their own content to make content. Mm -hmm. And you know, yeah. what I just was wondering is like, if we start going back to the beginning of television what were they telling us at those times right there's there and, and some of those old movies that we think are classic well now if we open our eyes and look at things from what we know now it was in our face at that point too right right oh, 1909 yeah. laurel and hardy um laurel was already wearing a dress all the way back then ingrid bergman all the way back in the day was wearing men's clothes um, the Duke, what's that guy's name? The Duke. John Wayne. Was wearing a dress. I think I could go back all the way. James Cagney, 
James Stewart, you could go all the way back and people are kind of thinking this is a new trend and it's like, no, look it up. All the way back then, they've already been reversing, you yeah. know, clothing. And, and then the, like the micro economy starlet for Judy Garland, they just kept oh, drugged oh, up and oh. like that was a sad story. Shirley Temple around all the men, like it was there's some sad stories out there, but be, they be entertain. So you gotta, there's the, there's the bells and whistles and the facades of Hollywood, but it's also why it's the land of lost souls and lost angels, land of lost angels. But it's, um, it's dark. And some of these people who do sign these contracts, that's ego. They're controlled by their ego and their ego is being feasted on and it will just amplify, you know, once they sell some, some just, are protected, you know, or they have that voice inside of them that's a little stronger. I, I got myself out of cars just because there was something in me saying, don't go there. Do not go to this party. And I'd be like, I'm not supposed to go. Like somehow I would just get myself out of the situation and then later find out about it and be like, I, how'd that happen? I trust everything now. I trust all of me now. All of you. <laughs> yeah. All of you. Yeah, so when you course. when you made your big trip to the West Coast, and you you have all these ideas in your mind, was that how did how did it feel when you started to see what was actually going on? Was yeah. there sort of like a burst of your bubble, and then it's like, oh, I have to be like really conscientious of who I am and where my boundaries are. Was that you know, was that a big awakening or was that something that just came about? It came later. It came later in life. Like I also was raised with following your bliss and with the mindset of from auditioning early, my folks taught me like, oh, well, you know, that one's not meant for you. Like I was, I was never like distraught or depressed. It was a hustle and I loved it. Like I, I did not sit back and wait to be discovered. Like I hustled and the hustle game was fun. Like I just, I loved the adventure that I was on. I loved running into what I would call angels, like that courier job. You're supposed to wear this gnarly t-shirt and khakis, but they let me dress up. They're like, I know what you're doing. You could hustle. You can go to the mail room today. And I'm like, oh, thanks. <laughs> you know, like I would play the game too, but in a, I want to get my career going way, not in my, I need to be a star. Just like I want to make a living and show all the teachers that sent me off in Chicago with the most beautiful goodbye party of follow your dreams. You know, I'm going to show them I'm doing it. And um, it was, and then craft service, basically when I was in that audition, like I didn't know the pedo stuff. I didn't know all these worlds. I did feel guided, but I didn't know what from. I just knew you know, there were some instances in Chicago where I'd find myself partying or after hours or underneath clubs. And I worked at a mobster Italian restaurant where Mark Grace was stalking me. He's a, a, a Chicago cub, like just these things. I was I was in this little like, little world navigating it for a little while, but not truly understanding the demons of it all. And um, but I, I was the, I was a good girl from the Midwest. So I was kind of like. I, I had no desire to have it all. I just wanted to um, shine bright and, you know, make my family proud, but also have a family, like just be average. <laughs> so when I. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was going to say, would you agree that it is like the frog in the pot? Like the, cause you were in an environment where it, it was warm. And then as time goes on, it heats up. And then if you're not paying attention, it starts to boil, but it's too late because you, you've gotten so deep. Because you're, you're describing an atmosphere where it's like, yeah, I'm into some mid-grade drama. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When it, by Mama. then, when it was craft service and I was kind of running this little mini empire of a way and getting really good clients, um, I fell into like Max Spears and was reading about the elite pedal rings and um, the CCP with, with Hollywood. And I started making, drawing the line, uh, drawing it, putting it together. And I did have that thought of, I'm supposed to be here. Like, I'm, I, what can I do? I'm gonna light it up. I'm gonna light this bitch up. Like, that's what I was like. Right. So I kind of was like, ooh, here's my next hustle. And so I would put myself sometimes purposely 
like kill someone with kindness or, you know, sneak around lots. Like I'm going to find the trap door. Like, like I take, I'm going to take my little Blackberry and take a picture. Like I, I was trying to do things without making a stir. Um, and at the same time, finding the others before I knew what that meant. Like I would drop little things on set to see who would pick it up. Like, oh, they know what I'm talking about. And then we'd have these conversations. And then by my last four or five years, I was known as craft spiracy. I would talk about everything. And oh, then I learned wow. the art of the delivery. I'm like, they, even though I knew of gay mafia and this and that, I also knew I was really damn good at what I did. And they were calling me, they needed me. So I would not make people uncomfortable, but I would stir the pot, see where everybody sat. And then I just kind of ebbed and flowed with it all. And the group of those who knew the truth behind Hollywood and stuff grew and grew and grew. And I'm like, everybody knew this. So I think you had asked me before, like, why then stay in it? Because it's, we're a bunch of artists and we're creator, we're creator beings. And it's a, a, a lifestyle and a career that allows everyone, even felons, like a second chance, a chance to follow your bliss and so many different skill sets, hair, makeup, you know, props, building, construction. Um, uh, there's so many parts that are needed to make uh, actual make content for screen that it brings in all the vagabonds and everything. But you can make a beautiful living working part time. And that's why I think it is an industry that's not going to go away, but that it's uh, you know, it is a wonderful place to work in when you can navigate. But I also do believe it can navigate without all that crazy dark stuff. Well, of course. And that's what's draining now. Yeah, yeah. And so that's oh. where we're flipping it light. And you expose them a little bit. The stories are going around a lot easier now. It's not so hard for people to comprehend that someone's been compromised. It's kind of, it used to be so taboo. And now it's like, oh, yeah, I heard about this, too. It's getting a little more normal. It's going to take a while, but. It's not going to, Hollywood's not going to go away. No, you know, I, I kind of got the feeling that if people, because it's kind of like the Me Too movement and also, but if people could get to the point where they stop compromising their morals to get what they want, would it not shut the whole thing down? If people, you know, because you could say, oh, well, I needed my job and, and so you had, you know, you, you took on your boss's advances. But get, what if people just got to the point where they stopped doing that? Now, because I heard a story about Thandi Newton. I don't know if she was somewhere between 16 and 18 years old and she tried out for a part. And they wanted to make sure she was mature enough. And they asked her to touch herself and they recorded it. So she did it. You, you. People say like, well, it, they kind of present it as if they have no choice, but you do have a choice. You could just not take the job. It's what are you yeah. willing to do yeah. for money? That's what, what divides you. Money? Yeah, that's what divides you. And the thing is, is you can have a beautiful career making either choice. They, there are people that won't do that in the cast room that will call them out and say that is absolutely illegal and wrong. Like there are good people even in positions of casting and producing it's just there is the light and dark in every department in the not just hollywood all of motion picture because i'm from chicago's well hollywood. and all of so all, that could be mcdonald's you know what i'm saying like everybody's at, at these jobs you know because we have to yeah. think about the i think sometimes people forget the culture of like uh, there's the movie the apartment and there's you know anything that had anything to do with marilyn monroe there was always this thing where you're you were propositioned and mm -hmm. if you did it, you were the cool girl. And you saw how in those movies back in the day, they chased the girls around the, you know, the the office and they had liquor in the drawer and they kind of like, like, okay, in the workplace, men run it, but if you want to work in it, you had to submit to that or or you could be Doris and look over your glasses and be very, <laughs> and be like, Mr. Johnson, get your mind right. But it was yeah. choice. It's, it's everywhere at our, in, in our, in our lives, really, right? You yeah. know, these choices. So 
One thing that I was going to say about that Thandie Newton thing was she didn't know that they kept the recording until she went to one of the Cannes Film Festivals or something like that. And someone said, I recognize you. We were at a party and they played a move, a video and you were doing X, Y, Z. And she was like devastated that they had been every time that guy had a party, he was showing the video over and over again. Then I saw how Shia LaBeouf, now right before he starts getting in trouble and he does this conspiracy movie or whatever, they told him to, they took a picture of his genitals, but they gave it to everybody, the camera people, the everybody on set, and they did like a humiliation thing to him. And then... Uh, career suicide, because he was speaking up. Yeah, they just right. started career suicide with him. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, I think initially it was an initiation. Then, I mean, when you when you really want to get out, that's when they start sending TMZ after you. I hope people realize, like, TMZ actually does the opposite. So, if TMZ is harassing people, it's because you're good, probably. Not and and sometimes they get called by that person. You know, that person's team. Mm-hmm. They get called by teams. Especially that's how the whole paparazzi thing started. They get called to say, so our, my client is going to be at this restaurant with so-and-so. Like, they barter. How much for the picture? That's how the money and the picture and the paparazzi thing exploded. And their tip-offs, Kardashians are really big with that. They're the ones that we, where we learned that from. And um, I think I was telling you, too, that indie movie I worked on, and Taryn Manning was on it. And bless her. I thought part of my craft service table is like um, toiletries and like refresh yourself and herbal vitamins and Kleenex and blah, blah, blah. But magazines, like take your magazine to the porta potty or whatever you want to do. But here's some fun little reads. And I used to get the rag mags. And every day I'd find them in the garbage next to my can. I'd be like, oh, like that's my budget. Who's throwing these away? And I would read them and consume them. They're addicting. And finally I caught her thrown away. And she's like, you know, all of this is a facade, right? Like all of that is paid and she kind of downloaded me a little bit. And I was like, I will never buy these again. <laughs> it is, it's part of the seeding the consciousness of the public to get them juicy on something. And they navigate the narrative that way. They get, that's how people explode. And, you know, you get that one hot picture of someone or naughty picture and sometimes it's set up. And so I don't rag mags. I don't touch anymore. Um, yeah, even, yes, TMZ get t- t- get some tip-offs, and, you know, again, there's some people that mean well. They just want to do well, and they love taking pictures. I mean, there's so many devil and angel situations you have where you can make a right choice. It's just, to me, I feel making the right choice, it's the marathon. The, the bad choice is the sprint. You've got to be in for the long haul because you will be rewarded, I feel. The universe will provide. You make that quick, easy lure there's your strung out kids. There's your, you know, that's where they kind of something happens or, you know, they just their own demise. We hear that with the sprint and the marathon because we just talked to Sal Marks the other day. And what did he say? The ego wants all the rewards without doing the work. It's beautiful. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. A lot it's a, of it's practice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't know the New York Stock Exchange. Like you don't just get on it. Or not Stock Exchange. The New York times bestseller list oh, I know. for you to be on that you when you publish your own book you have to buy a certain amount of copies of your own book that's how you end up on a new york times bestseller list like everything is not what you think it is it it's it's, it's people underneath that's why when the will and jada when they had the what's that thing called the the entanglement and I looked at people, I said, don't y'all know these people have been in an open relationship since the day they got, since before they got married? Like they've had an open marriage this whole time. So that, this is, this entanglement is not really, a, this is actors acting like actors act when they're acting all and, the time. Nothing in the headlines is just by chance. It's, it's all planned and people get so emotionally wrapped up. Will, I feel sorry for him. And I'm like, why are y'all feeling sorry for rich people right now? <laughs> Well, do you know, I had some co- old coworker pals because I used to do um, the Emmys green rooms and things like that. That whole slap was rehearsed. <laughs> they did sound check on that. It's, and even it and everything. Yeah. it's a scene out of a 70s movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, that was set up. And so I said like, this, Heidi, if a man is 240 pounds and he's six foot two and he slaps a little 180 pound um guy who's five foot ten if you slap him and he can still pass out and read envelopes then something's wrong with you 
<laughs> you should not be able to slap him. And then somebody else said, well, I wouldn't have slapped him. Yeah. And then, uh, oh, I, I love that other guy. I don't know what that guy's name is. He's from The Office, but it's the British oh. version of The Office. Ricky Gervais. Gervais. Oh God, Ricky Gervais. Gervais. So he he said uh, he said no, I wouldn't have slapped him. I'd have slapped the guy who slept with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I love okay. yeah, he's great. Yeah, how about that guy, the guy that slept with your wife? Uh, well, and let's just say that Pfizer, who came out with the alopecia drug, sponsored that whole event anyway. So. <laughs> Yeah. I keep telling people, get your mind right. It's so funny sometimes when I see people who don't know, like don't have a clue about it. I'm like so confused because I just assume people know and they don't. Yeah. And for a while, I thought that was my job to make sure they know. And that was the art of the delivery for a while. But then it's like, then we had that pause where we, I was not on set anymore. And then that was of now I'm like, I can't tell anyone anything. They have got to dot connect themselves. You plant the seeds gently and then just hope one day they'll get it. Maybe in this lifetime they won't. But I realize that's not my job because it's 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 draining my life force and my you know. So that's a that's a that was a hard pill the last few years. Yeah, to too. that's like hot coals on someone's head because you're giving them something that they don't want. You're giving people information they don't want, and so you're mm -hmm. you're being rejected. So when was the pause? Was it around the time of 2020 during the medical Holocaust or? Yeah. Yeah. March 2020. I, my last job, ironically, was a, um, a cell phone for China <laughs> and the my, the client agency all wore masks and everything. And I remember having <laughs> holding the extras hostage at my table. I'm like, OK, there's going to be this shutdown, but it's going to be OK. <laughs> you just get a couple months of food and you're good. We're going to be over. It'll be soon. I had no idea it was going to go full on like it did. Um, so we shut down and again, no fear. I'm like, this is fine. And it kept going and kept going and kept going. And I'm like, oh, this is the long game. Um, but remember, Hollywood became essential. So they opened up just June. Meanwhile, all our restaurants, everything were closed in LA, but Hollywood was work open. And they started making content again. And I'm like, guys, Hollywood's open. They know and they know everything. So please stop with the fear because they're open making contact for you to watch in years coming time. So we're good. They also, before shutdown, by the way, were making content about viruses and masks and quarantine. So all truth and transparency. Yeah. 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 But I, I would go back to set. Yeah. June. I, I even just got asked a month ago from a referral of a referral. Um, hey, are you back? And I do my same response. Um, that I'm not due to medical choice. They still test every day. And depending on where you're set up or what studio you're working with, like Disney and Fox are some of the worst. Sometimes you can't even get on the lot without your yellow card. And um, I just like, I can't. And and it only divinely happened that way because the giant came in my life. My kid's step dad, I just eloped like three years ago, right before lockdown. And I was like, and so he works the cameras and the cranes on set. He doesn't mind showing the fake stuff because he's a beast. And I'm like, you're good. <laughs> I go, but I can't. I was talking. I was craft spiracy. I can't show up like that. Like, I'm done. And I'm out. I like mic drop and walk away. And that was 35 years of navigating the motion picture business and stuff. So, it's interesting yeah. you would say that about Disney because I went there after the conference last year and mm -hmm. nobody was wearing a mask. They didn't have a lick of sanitizer out. They were serving drinks without lids with paper straws. Really? It was absolutely ice. And then so the girl, they don't have on no hair net. And you flipping around, talking over my open drink. And I was just like, ah! <laughs> like, I might not be a person that's really into that medical conspiracy saying that this is how we're all going to die, right? But I am a person who worked in a lab and I have worked in food services and I knew that they were doing everything they could possibly do wrong in a restaurant. And so right. to have this stance of having to wear a mask in the Hollywood, they were oh having my God. a kid's theme park where everything was a free for all. Nobody, there were no masks and they were not ours. No lids on. No yeah, lids. Disneyland. Here. Concerning. No lids on drinks yeah. is the most concerning thing to me. I was just like, can you please cover up my drink, please, while you talking over my food and whatnot. Yeah, but they, 
they still have everything individually wrapped and everything out here. And the Disney lot, I mean, Disneyland opened with restriction. Um, um, of course, so the restrictions have lifted. Now it's like people are like, whatever, no masks and no cards. They're not bothering with that. But working for them, it was one. Of, it's one of the hardest. I think um, Viacom was the other one. They just like minimum wage. They're the lowest paying, the, the longest time to get your paycheck. They rarely went union even because you can get around a lot of rules. It's like the Disney people, it's like that the rich get richer because they penny pinch. <laughs> so they really penny pinch crews and budgets. I loathed my Disney jobs because they barely gave me any money to work with. And sometimes it was a little independent guy who was like, how much do you want to make what you do? And I'm like, thank you. <laughs> I don't have to stretch the money and budget. Like there's some really greedy companies out there and they're the most influential affluent companies out there there <laughs> wow yeah so so during this whole time as people are elevating in their consciousness of what's actually happening around them have people ever approached you and and accused you of being a part of the sickness or no i've had i've had a lot of apology letters like oh, wow. i'm sorry honey, i had no idea and you tried you tried to tell us you crew people even moms moms that really gave me a hard time at our old school which was this little waldorf school and um where i was working a lot so my kids were safe there i had a lot of teams of moms that helped take my kids to school and drop them off if i was on set or something but i would always try to tell them you know, like, be careful, you know, there's this agenda coming or watch the content you watch, you know, there's if you even watch, I would just download them on stuff. Even when 45 came around, I was really an advocate of what he was doing, his administration was doing, and I was shut out of that community so fast. And I'm like, okay, you know, in, enjoy your show. And they've been coming around going, I'm sorry I looked at you that way on the playground. Right. Like, you were were you really trying and Right. So that was cool. You know, I'm going back and I'm looking at old things that I used to watch, like the Mindy show or Claws. These are my guilty pleasures, y'all. I like to watch some raggedy shows sometimes, but I got fun too. Or, or Broad Street Girls. I think it's Broad Street Girls where they're in Brooklyn and, and they're always talking about Hillary. And they're always talking. And so I, did, I hadn't realized back then, maybe it was a time where I stopped watching TV. I don't know what happened. But then I started seeing, like, say on Claus, she said, you know, the the clan, we don't wear hoods anymore. We wear red hats. Mm -hmm. And I was just seeing how they, they had gone through all the television shows and they were making sure to put the Hillary agenda right across in your face. But I didn't see it back then. I, I don't know if I really even would. I, it's like I went through a time of not looking at anything for so long. And now I'm looking back like, oh, my God, look at all this. Yeah. Stuff. He said, no wonder John Q. Public was so inflamed because it was on your nightly on the nightly shows saying this is the clan. This is this. This is that. And, and really programming people. Very the programming very, very, people. Wow. Huge. Yeah. There was that show Pretty Little Fires or Dirty. Not something with Reese Witherspoon show. I see it didn't make a second season, but I was doing their, not a director's cut, but behind the scenes with the cast, like before they launch kind of thing and promos and stuff. And we were on their sets and they would take turns one actor at a time, Reese as well. And they would just talk about their character and talk about how great the show is going to be coming out. But they all had talking points and it was all attacking 45. And I was, my table was like 10 feet from him. And I'm just like, mm-hmm. Like, I was just like, I see what they're doing here. And it was, they, and you could see like the young ones were uncomfortable. They were just like, oh yeah. And, um, you know, they make their 45 joke and then they'd be like, kind of like they had to do it. Wow. <laughs> I'd be like, wow. Reese loved my snacks, by the way. <laughs> but she's a little spitfire, but I'm like, they, um, there's also, gosh, I don't even want to say her name right now because it came from mom friends. She, her daughter went to a school we know, Waldorf School. She's an Academy Award winning actress. And a friend went to her house and they didn't know what to do with their masks. They had their people helping at the house that were all masked up, but she and her child didn't know what to do. And she finally told my friend that, you know, they give us a one sheet 
when lockdown hit, all of talent and all these agencies got this one sheet of what to say, what to do, how long they can go without posting. Um, they have to post about BLM, Me Too. You know, they are given the points. And if they well, don't, they well, get dropped well. from the roster. If not, they get dropped low and then off completely if they become someone that they can't control. And wow. that was like, of course, my friend told me right away. And I'm like, I'm not surprised. But it also, when you work and you know those things, you start working with these people and going, poor thing. Not, oh, my God, here comes so-and-so. It's more like, hi, sweetie, are you okay? <laughs> are they miking you right now, controlling you? It's, right. it's kind of sad, really. Christy, Christy Alley, I know she did an interview talking about that, too, where she just, she said she couldn't say a word. She couldn't express herself at all. That she really got dumped because of her views and she wasn't going to change them and she wasn't going to follow the program. So it was like, okay, no work for you. You know, and I can't imagine. Okay. I absolutely hated Saturday Night Live too, because I thought, why are we making jokes about something so important happening? And it, 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 <laughs> I just really looked at the level of intelligence of people because it's not like my family wasn't watching it. And I was looking at them like, you think this is, so you think this is funny. Like this is the fate of the world we're talking about. And you're making a joke on Saturday Night Live and your whole Saturday Night Live basically was about the whole campaign. It was stunning and devastating to me at the same time, the lack of yeah. intelligence or the lack of seriousness where I think back a long time ago, you'd, you'd have called that uh, treason. A lot of what you would have, that would have been all considered treason at one point, or you'd been called a communist and you'd been carted off somewhere for, you know, making light of the country, you know? Right, it's big business. Yeah, I, I lost it with Kathy Griffin when she put that mask up, that bloody. I, I, and then Wanda Sykes, she said he should kill himself. And so I was thinking, like, these are things that you could go to jail for. And people were just like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, no, where are we going? <laughs> like, yeah, we were in some real danger. I know you guys are in Canada, but, you, you know. We weren't oblivious to it, though. Nah. Uh, yeah. Nobody makes fun of Trudeau up there, do they? <laughs> Not on television. Ladies are too polite. <laughs> <laughs> Reserved at times, but uh, there's some that make you know will poke fun and and speak the truth, and it's coming more so these days. You know, it's it's quite entertainment in their in the whole their whole uh, Congress well, or whatever they have. They heard conversations and they're talking to the speaker and I was just like this is so I just always find that so strange like you're talking to this person but you're staring at the speaker and you're talking and they're like redirecting I'm like those poor speakers they must be grounding constantly to be able to take that amounts of crap from from those guys um but yeah well, here's something, because I'm just really into, like, these minutia. I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> There's a movie came out on Netflix it's called Don't Fuck With Cats. And I'm not going to tell people to watch it because it's, it's very graphic that someone is a person who becomes a serial killer and he's harming cats and he's putting it live on YouTube and he does it. And so it gets all these people around the world are, like, trying to find this particular guy. When he graduates to doing it to an, a, a person, he does this. He actually chops the guy's foot off and he mails it to Trudeau. So they didn't tell you guys about that. No. You never heard about that. They mailed him no. a foot. So this was a part of the murder investigation. Was And I thought it was interesting because the young man was saying he was a, um, he was a gay teen and he was working the strip club circuit and so he was uh, in his story when he told one of the psychiatrists that he was approached by a very wealthy person and invited to do some things and that he was never really doing all of it on his own but that there was someone else running the camera and you can expand from there what that all sounds like 
that he was being some type of victim for some elite cult or something like that. But, um, and he mailed Trudeau a foot. So that was just Supposedly. interesting how it, the, the only place I ever heard about it was on Netflix, on Netflix, <laughs> on a movie documentary, not, wow. not the news. No, that's news. No, we don't hear a lot of stuff on the news. So I knew today was going to be a juicy day because I do I do dig into some gossip, you know. <laughs> and then I had some superlatives, but then I think because we we shot on to the celebrity real fast. I, I was like, wait, the kids. <laughs> I know because we, but I did I did want some of your superlatives because we had like uh, you know I always heard like people like Goldie Hawn they have dirty feet or like these certain people that are really smelly. Or there's certain people who, when they're supposed to be acting in a sex scene, that they take advantage of things like that. And, and so. Yeah, it's so weird that they would, because it's such an awkward thing. You've got like 20 to 50 people around you. <laughs> I was like, why would you take, that's a voyeuristic thing to do, take advantage of it. But. What do you think about it? When people used to be kings and queens and they get married the first night, remember that your family and the priest and the everybody would stand by the bed for you to make the first move and <laughs> like we gotta make sure we got some penetration. Could you imagine? But so evidently it, it must be some type of tradition, I guess. So thing. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bigger than on the beach but did you have some superlatives because you had some people oh, yeah. really nice to you pardon you know, really kind right yes there's been some and I am I you're right I should have probably dug deeper on some old school ones because I don't want to repeat the stories from shows that I've said these things well I the first thing I have to say when you said smell and I think I told you ladies this before because I have to say it because I can't get it out of my nose still was Patton Oswald he was just and 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 the the thing is is he's a germaphobe so I had to have I think it was like 37 some OCD number of the little this is way but this is before lockdown and stuff of the germ stuff in his room, in the bathroom, on set, in the basket, all of at his table, da, 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 like anywhere he'd walk, he so he could do it. But he was so stinky um, that even the big burly grip guys would walk around him, like being like, "This guy is foul." And I'm like, "That's because he's a demon." <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, germphobe and just rude and crass, and he looked right through me, like he just could not. And I wore my Q shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And wow. we did we were doing an Easter promo for some show that he did a voice on and they're like, Does anyone want to wear this big universal Easter bunny hat? And I had my Q shirt. I'm like, I'll deliver the basket on set and I had it on and then they're like, No, no, Heidi, client needs you to take it off. And I'm like, Arr. But I got a picture of me with my Q shirt, Patton's strange name, his dressing room, and then the hat. <laughs> I'm like, Light workers gotta do what you gotta do. I don't but, think you yeah. check that out. That looks like Marduk, doesn't it? Yeah. That. Mm -hmm. He has so many voiceover. He is all over the place. People if you know notice so how busy Oswald Patton is, guys, yeah. you got to look at the video games and cartoons and stuff that he's in. It's these people that are so, like, you, you think that they're background actors, but they're really more in charge of things than you think. Kind of like BJ well, Novak. He because he was making waves and headlines and conspiratorially he was getting outed a lot, you know, he put him thrown behind the scenes. A lot of the A-lists, when if there's something controversial that comes out, they'll just give him a voiceover. So it keeps their contract going. So they fulfill their contractual duties and then get their income they were promised. Um, not yeah, just the dark so contract. I'm talking literally nice. like a work. Yeah, yeah they, they start doing his wife would launches him into like this great bit of success. When you see people's family members die, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, they get a dream job, you know. But maybe he is a germaphobe because he doesn't believe in taking baths. He thinks he can just sanitize his hands and he's good. Well, or if you're a cannibal. Yeah. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> well, I can't there. I, I, I'm not saying anything. Um, <laughs> well, when you say the cafe is there, you know, that's um, um, the wife of 
the man who owns Fake Book, she was a part owner of a cannibal cafe. So. Oh, uh, her sister. Oh, her sister. sister. Yeah. They also say yeah, too that some of those. Yeah. They also say some of those reality shows, like Top Chef or something, when there's cooking, that they don't give the best cook the the winner. They give them runner up so that they can negotiate with them to do other things. Some of them become chefs in those kind of clubs, and then the sure. winners because they're contractually obligated to the network. For a year, so they want to take the ones that they want. Like you, you know, are really good. Them. Come to my house and give me some fillet of skin. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, I have a theory because it seems like the world top chefs keep dying, and I'm thinking probably because they know what is really being cooked in certain places. Because it seems like the last two or three years they've just been like, "Whew, out." People sometimes the conscious catches up with you. You start speaking up, and then they just try to shut you down. Yeah. So that's why I'm like full full armor of God. I'm like, am I really going to share stories? And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm working on a coffee table book. <laughs> I'm just going to wait till our kids are grown. <laughs> but yeah. I'm also just disclosing nothing really new. I guess nothing there's new. Not. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. but with the, not, uh, to, lighten, to lighten it up, I have to share a really sweet story. There's, there was um, Patrick Dempsey. This was a really sweet story with him. And I didn't, I mean, I didn't watch all, was it Grey's Anatomy, any of those shows, but I was like, can't buy me love from the eighties. I mean, that was my show or movie. And I remember I got to set really, really early. I had to set up his trailer and um, I'm parked right next to the trailer and I'm unloading. And all of a sudden some baseball hats pulled down. Let me help you, ma'am. And, starts helping me and where do you want this oh right over there sir. and then it's like 30 minutes later I'm like thanks for your help you know what's your p I thought he was a PA production assistant I'm like what's your name he goes oh hi I'm, I'm Patrick Dexy I'm like what and I was like oh my gosh don't tell the production I, go, I just made you carry my ice and he was a sweet pea and I'm like he didn't have to do that and he also drove himself to set which barely ever happens they usually get rides um he sits with crew like he 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 was he was lovely and looked real you know like he had some wrinkle like he was just just kindness like that um the other one and this you know could be controversial because everyone says family blood but um ron howard's daughter dallas howard oh, just yeah. as, oh, i loved her i did all the jurassic park like when they remade the movie at universal we did all the films for that and then we also did the international promo so like one week we had hong kong because universal everywhere we had um china we had all the teams but she was there and she didn't was barely in her dressing room she just she was a new mom she sat on set the whole time she asked me questions she i bought her all these super super fancy um juices like shots like eight dollars she i just pimped her out because she wanted clean living she's gluten-free and she goes i'm not gonna drink all those she goes come on come have some with me she goes do your kids like these i'm like eh. and she goes but you do go on take them like just just love i just love people who are be, bringing being a little more human and not class system some just treat you like absolute dirt like so my hardest jobs were i'm sorry but it was the french jobs like l'oreal or um Jean-Baptiste Mondino, he's a famous photographer. He did give me a kiss on the cheek at the end, but it stung for a while. Um, the he, they were just like, I was treated like a third class citizen, like, and just worked to the bone, no gratitude, like conditions that are, you know, should have been reported to the union, but they, they get you under the table with cash, the promise of cash, so they can treat you like a dog like just stuff like that where I'm like dude I'm as old as you like why are you treating me this way there's people like that that you're just like oh horrible impression and then you meet just these sweet peas who are like thank you for looking at me in the eye and thank you for saying thanks and thank you for appreciating what I'm doing a lot of those there's there's a, still a lot of those out there Katy Perry's rude <laughs> 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 uh, I heard she's vegan her and she ate, she ate all my beef jerky. So I'm like, oh, I'm not vegan. is she supposed to be a big old vegetarian or vegan or something? Yeah, I'm like, I saw you. <laughs> 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 That's the kind of stuff's fun to have those in the back pocket. You know, I'm yeah. like, oh, that'd be a fun yeah. little book one day. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I heard something about her in American Horror Story, the coven, like the seven wonders and. 
a lot of those people are, you know, when they make jokes about the, or just make shows kind of making light of these things, that these really are not just movies. There's something to pay attention to all the time. Making oh. these jokes. So, but uh, some Dramatria channel, they were just talking about how she went through the Seven Wonders, how she's really like, you know, one of America's top witches. I, I can see that because there were three jobs and you could see the transition because the beginning was a little more sugar pop, you know, and, and then the middle was the beef jerky. And then by the end, it's just like possession. And you're like, oh, and but then there's the shelves like Brittany. I'm, I'm so sorry for her. A couple jobs with her. And by the last one, I was convinced to clone. And then I'm like, nope just a puppet they would have to they put their hands on their waist to walk her I remember I pimp out trailers and I'm like you know I need her rider her request and I'm like oh just give her blackberry tea she's gonna have an elliptical trainer in her trailer and she'll be on that until she's called on set and that was like eight hours and just tea in that and she just came out like a shell and bear could barely do anything and she actually fled the set in her dress that was pretty much sewed onto her because it was so like, and she was just chanting, I got to get my boys. I got to get my boys. And she fled off in that famous white convertible Mercedes and like a ton of her team members fled after her. And their excuse was, we got to get the dress back. And like, no, you don't. She's trying to run away from you. Like it, that was, that was really sad. Her light was out. Totally light was out. That was a sad one. So there's some shells that you're just like, Ooh, there's the micro economy. She's just exhausted. She's exhausted. So yeah, that was these videos where the, some people, especially like Lady Gaga, is crying and 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 then they kind of snap back and make a new video and they're like, no, everything's great. But you, you saw, you know, those small videos where they're crying out like, I can't sleep, I can't eat. I know. Night, so, you know, but mm -hmm. yeah. some of the music videos, they'll stick to the same teams. Well, actually, a lot of productions. If a production goes well, and it's a production company, and then they hire the crew, um, but the department heads are usually approved by the client agency. When you get the right team together, you know, you do all the jobs. And I used to do, like, just runs of things. Um, my, my kid's dad, who he's not in the picture anymore, but I remember when he came once home from, he did all Gaga's. And he said she was just buck naked the whole time. She would sit spread eagle with everything right out, just like, and stages are cold. And she's like, she was just trying to show her parts. Like everybody saw everything, crew sees everything. But she was just like purposely sat in front of the grips and things like, huh, spread. Like, <laughs> like, look at me, look at me, look at me. Maybe that's that feeling of I am nothing anyway. That's, that resonates okay. too. If you already doing what we think you're doing at night, being spread around and passed around, then it's no big deal, right, to be. Yeah. And there's that fetish of making people uncomfortable. Yeah, like, too. You know, a lot of jobs, especially Apple. Effect. That might be a loose yeah. gathering technique. You're right. That is, I actually heard that from, a, there was a thing about energy vampires that, that they yeah, are making, pe making people feel awkward is a part of how they get oh, yeah. energy. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, but there there are a lot of jobs where you have to check in like that Jurassic one I did that you have to surrender your phone and or or like Apple's really big on this because they have, always have new products and spies and you have to put stickers on, you know, like your on your phone if you if it's with you and they check them through the day and you'll either get set off set or, you know, confiscated. So they just sometimes just you have to leave everything at the start of the day because that's how a lot of these things don't leak. But people tell stories, so that's how the stories leak. Um, and then those that, so when a photo does come out that becomes super controversial, even crews like, ooh, who's going to get blacklisted because you're not supposed to take that picture. Even my hubby will send me videos. Like he does Billy Eilish videos and he does a lot of big stuff. And I'm like, get off the phone. <laughs> what are you doing? Said he goes, show the kids. And I'm like, he doesn't know what he's doing, but I'm like, that's like rule number one. You can't be seen taking photos sometimes. And then other times they want you to. They're like, like Betty White we used to work with. And by the way, Betty White, at the end of the day, she always wanted a plain hot dog and a vodka neat. That was her night. That was at the end of every shoot. But she would also at 
the end of a run, like a series or a long job, we she would spend the last few hours, even if it went into 1 a.m., taking pictures with crew and people and stuff. So I do know all the Betty stories and everything. She was lovely as can be, but I'm sorry, like a plain hot dog can go both ways if you think about it. And so that was weird. So, so since you brought that up, what was it? What was the thing with Betty White and Ryan Reynolds? You know, I don't know, but I know Ryan Reynolds personally. <laughs> what was the thing with Betty White and Ryan Reynolds? Well, she would always sort of discredit him or, you know, talk down on him. So it was always kind of interesting. Like she would walk by him and stuff. Oh, my goodness. You know, I I did miss that. Or the show we worked on was her clip show she would do. Um, these video clip things. I can't remember the name of it. Um, and then, of course, green rooms and stuff. Um, and just like a character, like a full character acting almost. Um, and then Ryan, I knew because I kind of lived in the world of Alanis for a while. I dated her best friend. I, we had holidays together. You know, um, we, yeah, I stayed at New Year's Eve. I went on tour with them on her bus. Like I was, I hung out with her with two different boyfriends. One was Ryan Reynolds and one was Woody Harrelson's lawyer. And then she, the DJ and the, now her, she has a child. She's very cool. Very sweet. Um, child I think she was hurt as a child though but you didn't know that the world the world we were around with her was fabulous and so was Ryan and it was right before Marvel but he was very kind um very very kind I remember waking up in the morning and my craft service van was out their house and he goes you what you smuggling in there and I was just joking like I'm I'm off to the desert I had to this I stayed here to do the party I hang out with you guys but I gotta leave I got a call time and he and he's like, well, our guard gate, you know, saw your van. They thought we were in trouble. I'm like, oh, that's just our our own personal craft service lady. And he was joking with me. It was really sweet. And um, but our biggest funny thing is when I came down the stairs, I had this brown beanie and like a long sleeve shirt with a T-shirt over it. And he had the exact same colors on. He's like twinning. And I'm like, just that he was just kind, you know, again, with the kindness, nothing nefarious. And it was not soon after because they did have a fight on Thanksgiving that Scarlet was around so I was like "Ooh, was that the fight you know that Scarlet came in the picture and I was in and out of life because this boyfriend I just I'm like I didn't care who he was friends with I just wasn't feeling the love he had so I kind of broke off twice with them and then I'm like I know I'm this is a fun lifestyle because he was like look at my friends and this is what you know you can have if you date me and I'm like but my heart's not happy so I'm gonna go <laughs> back to hustling so that's why they were in and out of my life I should say, but I when when the stories went around him selling himself, I'm like, I don't know. He was a he's a he might be one of those micro economies that is just a smart businesswoman. They also didn't party like that crazy Hollywood style. I made pot brownies and we drank tequila. Like that was kind of the extent of the massive parties that would happen at their house. Um, that was a lot, wasn't it? <laughs> Sorry, Ryan. Wow. <laughs> That's good, thanks. It was perfect. Yeah, he was a sweet pea. Where, where I draw the line is I remember how character -y, now she was a puppet, but Betty, you know, versus Ryan was a little more natural in his body. Betty was performing even when the cameras weren't rolling. So you just, I can't, I can't say one or the other about them, but you can't help but dot connect once in a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just rambling now. <laughs> yeah. so you guys are talking about Betty White, oh, right? the elderly woman Betty White. Yeah, yeah. Golden Girls. Who passed? Yeah, yeah. I don't know who Ryan Ryan Reynolds is. I don't know who that. Is. He's what? Deadpool. Huh? Deadpool. Deadpool. He, he's the star of Deadpool. And uh, huh. what, was it? what was that yeah. uh, NPC movie that he made uh, two years ago? And the, he was, the he was the oh gosh, he's he just cute eyes. He's very handsome. He's very funny. Like that, like that is 24 seven. Um, and not slapstick like Jim Carrey with the faces. He was just witty, like just yeah. quick. And that's what Alanis loved. Like they were, she's like that too. They were just hysterical. Um, um both Canadians. Yeah. Yes, yes, right. I, I was gonna tell you guys wow. when you both said that. 
My favorite clients and directors I worked for were Canadian. It was just the best sets ever. They were just so cordial and kind and respectful. And they always, they honored what I did so much that I was so proud. I gave them, always gave them like a thousand percent. It was so sweet. There, it's just so true about Canadians. I'm telling you. <laughs> huh. Well, that's good. Sometimes, people I wonder, the way you want to sometimes I wonder, is the Academy different with Britain than it is in the United States? Like is just is United States just rotten, maybe? And no, you mean other than UK or you? Well, I mean they they have the Royals there. They're holding that down. That's pretty nefarious. Well, see, Vatican, we don't have the, so the royal family, the representation of the royal family here would be Hollywood, but they have the actual royal family. You know what I'm saying? Like so, it's interesting how the royal family, like like the extension of Hollywood really is, there is a bloodline that traces from our Hollywood over back to there. Yeah. Like, and look how they did with, what's her name? The, the newest lizard, Matt, <laughs> Matt. Merkel, the bloodline. Matt. They just gave her the show and the Netflix, the Disney, the contracts. It was there. It's kind of like, it's already a contractual thing they have, Hollywood and the Royals. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't, they're, Ew, I shake them off all the time. <laughs> the I'm trying to figure out what what makes people. I don't know. I'm like, well, why are they in in uh, Tyler Perry's house for free? Or like, it's just weird. Like sometimes I just wonder. These people aren't really alive anymore, and they're just taking <laughs> like like Tyler Perry's not there. Come on, guys, he's not really here anymore. Oprah's not really here. They're just people in fat suits or something. That's how I just think everybody's like, just someone in a fat suit sometimes. Oh, there you go. Fat suit, Jiminy Glick. He was a sweetheart too. Martin Short. <laughs> he was sweet. I'm sorry, another thought. Yeah, you know what? Because he, he would be one of the people from Saturday Night Live that just kind of disappeared for a bit. Well, I, I forgot. Yeah, I dated Tim Meadows for a minute. <laughs> just a few days very very shy quiet but he did, had nothing nice to, well he didn't not want to talk he didn't want to talk about snl we'll say that and with that being said rob schneider i think i was telling you last time he was one of my first craft service bosses kindest sweetheart ever and his brother loved them to pieces and i think they did walk away and check out you know whether they say fired or not they do they basically fund and do their own projects and I would do craft service on their projects and you can't not get in people's business on set you're with them to all the time you become just that carny lifestyle you breathe work sometimes have to sleep you know on travel jobs and you get to know these people and some you can't be around and others you're like tell me more you know you're an interesting person and Rob Schneider is one of those. And his daughter is the one who sings um, X's and O, that song X's and O. That's oh. before that song became a hit. And she would hang out with us and help and carry ice. And like, they're just a good family who loved the business and made their own content. I just had to bring them, him up as a no, nice I'm addicted one. to this. So I'm like, cause you, especially when we hit SNL, cause we just got through talking last night, just privately about like, what the heck is Tina Fey? What is she? How does she have so many shows? and books and I don't know. She seems yeah. more important than Alex Baldwin. I don't know, but I know a little family backstory with Kristen Wiig and she seems, I know she hit it really big too, but a good person like married to just a sweetheart writer um, who's works with the best friend's dad and our husband. Like there's, there you get the backstories of some of these people and you, you know, you can speculate all you want, but it's like, I just believe in the energy of the people. Mm -hmm. And if they feel good, they feel good. If they don't, they don't, there's your dark, there's your light. It's, it's kind of that simple, but you have to be up close and personal to feel that because it's all, it's all a show. So that's where I'm like, this person actually felt really good. Well, this person smelled like rotten flesh, you know, like you can't get that on the screen. No. So it's, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So that's why I mean, I have my good. two cents, but I don't know yeah. for sure anything. It's good to know that there are some good. Because yeah, you, you feel like you can't watch anything or do anything. When you watch a movie, you're like, ah, it's this person. I know. 
Well, that's why I stopped going on threads defending too, because I'm like, I can't prove anything to anyone except my own experience. And a lot of people are so set in that 100% all of Hollywood needs to burn down. Everyone is demonic. I'm like, nope, that's not right. <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I get really in, into those people that have even never even been here, you know, or any in any um, um, even advertising, because that's in every major city in the United States and Canada. Like, content and production is happening everywhere but the a-list hollywood hoo-ha-ha -ha can be manufactured and is old but it's it's also full of those that are of the light it's as in every industry i know we said that in the beginning so yeah, i can't even get on the choices, anymore. choices people have yeah choices. yeah and they just get to the point where they're like don't invite that fool to the party he gonna mess it up <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm going to take a hard pause right now.